Okay, let's try this again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Barnyards and Backyards Live. Um, I, my name is Jeff Edwards. I'm with UW Extension. I'm located at the research facility in Lingo, Wyoming. We have with us today also co-host Jeremiah Vardaman. He is UW Extension located up in Powell. And our featured guest today is uh, Hudson Hill. He's an extension educator in uh, Lincoln County, for, for lack of a better description. And also our, our support person who uh, constantly keeps us straight is uh, Jenny Thompson. And uh, she may be interjecting things as we go along. Uh, some uh, ground rules today. If you would like to ask a question, if you are uh, just learning how to use Zoom, uh, please use your mouse and scroll over the Zoom page at the bottom. You'll see a Q&A button. If you can use the Q&A button to um, input your questions there, or uh, if um, you're participating on Facebook Live, you can add a question there and we will try to get to it. Uh, please stay on topic today. Uh, we do, we're going to be offering a variety of these through, through I think about the end of June. And um, hopefully we can get to your questions uh, as we go and be on topic. Um, at the end of the program, there will be a, uh, a website or a web page that will pop up that is a, a, a survey about the program that you participated in today. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill that out because it allows us to track and then make improvements to the program. So the last thing I'd like to do is I want to make an attitude check. Everybody good? Yep, good to go. Also, just want to throw out there with the, the questions. If we don't get to their questions, right, if we're, they're not on topic, we can get in touch with us, get in contact with us, and we'll answer those questions individually and work with you, either through email or phone, uh, anything that way. So, yeah. Correct. And, and we'll provide information at the end on how to do that, and, and uh, not only us, but to contact your local extension educator. So, Hudson, if you would unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You can we hear me. Uh, today, our program is on poultry. And, Hudson, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and let you rock and roll, and we'll, uh, we'll just go from there. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really, really great to be on this morning. Appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm assuming there's people out there watching, so um, just kind of get started. I, I really enjoy talking about poultry. Um, in Wyoming, it's a really interesting topic. Um, they, uh, they, they tease me and they call me the chicken specialist and other, other things in Wyoming, my colleagues and others do. Um, realizing that, you know, specialist is a, is a term of endearment and it, the puddle's pretty shallow here in Wyoming of people who will talk about chickens. This morning, um, we, we were going to do a really, uh, how to start, a really simple, how to get started with chickens. I think, it, I think it's a really great project to have for people who are interested in, in growing food and having a backyard and those type of things. And chickens is just a really good way to start. I remember years ago reading an article that was so interesting to me. I've quoted it many times over the years. Um, there was a group that was going to third world countries. Um, and helping young single uh, women out of poverty. And, and the thing that the, would get them out of poverty was to have 12 laying guinea hens. 12 laying guinea hens was enough to bring that, that uh, young single mother out, out of poverty. Chickens are a great project. They're a great ag project and it's a really good way to to grow food so and that, something anybody could do right Hudson uh, maybe acreage size wise we don't have to have thousands of acres to do this right one of the things that really works well with poultry is it works really well on a small acre project um, a, a lot in town you can have uh, you know three or four birds having you know six six birds having and producing eggs that kind of thing um, I have five acres and we do we do hundreds of meat birds a year um, so yeah, it's, it's a really great project to have on smaller acreages. You, you still have to do things right. Uh, you know, when you say anybody can do, anybody that's willing to, to do it right can, can certainly do it. But, um, but well, yeah, it's my, a great project. 
you you know our ongoing commentary about you not liking broccoli right <laughs> I, I like i like chicken i enjoy chicken but i choose not to have any livestock <laughs> you know I, I i do classes in lots of ag pro, ag topics um throughout the year doesn't matter whether i'm in front of sheep guys or cow guys or people who want to raise hay um you know they'll ask me a question you know what what color of cow should I have or what type of sheep should I have or, you know, how should I do this? And, and I think the, the first basic question that we have to answer is the one that Jeff just alluded to. Is this something that'll make you happy? <laughs> right. And chickens are a great project and, and they can bring a lot of life um, enjoyment. They can bring a lot of enjoyment to life, producing food and, and having animals. I mean, there's a lot of enjoyment to it. And I'll talk about that in a minute when I talk about picking the right bird. But if it's something that you enjoy, that's how you're successful at it. If you're not going to enjoy it. If you don't like birds. Don't right? have chickens. If, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a really great project that way. So. Well, and I'd like to throw in there, Hudson, uh, if you live in town, you probably need to look into some city ordinances to see if you can have poultry at your place, correct? Yes, over the years, I've worked um, with five or six of the, the major uh, <clears throat> cities in Wyoming towards what their ordinances should be for chickens. Um, it's It's been a little disheartening how some cities have handled it, you know, just not, not allowing any chickens at all. Um, but, uh, but most cities in the state now, you can have um, up to six birds without a rooster and you know all you have to do is get out of the city limits and then you know if you're in the county you're you can pretty much do whatever you want so okay but yeah check city ordinances and you know the roost not having a rooster that's just to stay good good friends with the neighbors right <laughs> so because those roosters will make noise and they'll make noise every morning and it's usually earlier than City folks like Jeff Edwards want to get out of bed. So. Yeah, I don't live in the city, man. <laughs> so how do we get started, Hudson? <clears throat> so I think there's a couple of things uh, to do um, for success. Is my I'm sharing a screen here. Is it showing? Yeah, we yeah. can see it. Okay, so I'll get I'll just share a couple of slides here and and. Uh, and and talk about how what I think's for success. I think the first thing you need to do, and, and I was talking about this, is decide why you want chickens. And there's really lots of reasons you can have chickens and poultry in your backyard. And here's a few of those. Um, you know, pets. If you pick the right breed of chicken, they really make good pets. Um, there are they're like silkies and cochins. I mean, they're as nice to pet as a cat or a dog. They're soft. They call them silkies because they feel like silk. Um, they're really well mannered. Um, the kids can go out with a little hand of uh, little feet in their hand, and those chickens will crawl right up in their laps, and they're they're be a great pet. Bug control. I have a slide in a minute that uh, I tease chickens about being little T Rexes, but if you've if you've ever been around chickens, um, boy, they they're tough on any bug that's around. We have a lot of uh, um, in, insects here. The the one insect that pe the people really don't like is the um, the earwig, and and we can get them in really high numbers for a few weeks during the summer. And boy, any if I have chickens in the yard, I don't have earwigs. If I don't have chickens in the yard, you'll see hundreds of earwigs in the house. So bug control is cool. The, the main reason that most people want chickens is for eggs. Um, eggs is a great source of protein and, and uh, you know, when we're raising them in our backyard, we can do some things. Um, you can crack an, a, an egg from the, the from your backyard, an egg from the grocery store in the pan, and you can see the difference in them. Source of meat, we've done a lot of meat birds over the years, so I can talk about that. Um, you know, when you're raising some chickens in your backyard and doing it right, you're getting a, a, a great product that you basically can't get anywhere else. You know, ex exhibition, we have a lot of kids in 4-H showing, showing, showing chickens. Um, sorry, that was me. And then uh, there's some other things. I'll tell you why I have chickens. This is my oldest boy, and this is a few years ago. Um, 
but uh, I'll get right up on my soapbox and I'll tell people when you've got kids involved in, in agriculture, involved with animals, you know, I feel that way. It's a great project. Um, here's the slide I talked about with, uh, with the T-Rex and the, the chickens. It's really important to know where I'm coming from. Um, chickens are livestock. When they get feather, feathered in, they are as tough as a cow. If we can, uh, if we can keep them out of the wind and we can keep them dry, I mean, they, they will, you know, a lot of people think, oh, these Wyoming winters, we got to keep them, um, you know, we got to have heat for them and this and that, but you really don't. You, yeah. you, can, you can treat them just like livestock. The one thing, and I'll talk about it here in a little while, my presentation is predators. There's a reason that everything tastes like a chicken, right? That's because everybody <laughs> likes to eat chicken, <laughs> including Jeff Edwards, I guess. So yep. um, the, the, the one caveat to, to chickens is you have to, you have to have a plan for predators. And uh, we can talk about that here in a minute. Um, you know, they have to have some water during the winter. And then if you're going to have layer chickens, you don't need to have heat. But if you want them to lay eggs all year long, you do have to provide some light. So um, with that being said, I think we were going to stop here and see if Jenny had any questions out there for us. We have a question from Kim. You might want to answer it a little later. She asked, are there some chickens that are big, better egg producers? Is it Kim, you said? Yep. Uh, the answer is absolutely. Um, <laughs> and we will answer that in like three slides, if, if that's okay. <laughs> we're going to do chick care tips first, and then we're going to kind of get into picking the right bird and, and why you would pick birds, if that's okay, Jenny. So usually you're going to probably start with chicks when you want to start your first flock. Is that right, Hudson, if, or do you want to go with adult birds? If, no, if nobody's ever had chickens before, um, yeah, they're probably going to start with chicks. It is possible to buy pullets, you know, an eight-week-old bird from places uh if you know where that's at i don't know of anywhere in wyoming that you can do that um you can go to the front range of colorado and there's a place or two when they have them um they're really expensive like 25 dollars a bird um there's a place in utah that used to do it and i don't know it anymore most people order them you get them through the mail or you pick them up at, at one of our tractor supplies uh, murdoch's cow ranch stores kind of a thing um if I want to order them online, where would I look for that? So again, there's not a place in Wyoming. There's places in Nebraska, Colorado, Idaho to, to order from. You, you, you can do it online. Uh, the one th that we have struggled, we've really struggled mightily getting birds here alive through the mail er earlier in the spring. Um, you know, a cow ranch store, some of our, our, our farmer co-ops get them in pretty early and they can order a lot of birds. And so, you know, when you have hundreds of birds in a box, they, they stay warmer and they, they travel through the mail better. But I'll tell you, it's fun to get chicks through the mail. Um, <laughs> uh, my, kids, my kids love Chick Day because they get out of school. I, I let my kids be out of school for the day. And they, they get to take care of the chicks. These six bullets that I have shown here on the slide, they get to do these six things all day. Um, we get you know, we get quite a few birds in, usually several hundred, and the kids just love it. They're just these tiny little puffs of soft, and the kids just love taking care of them. So it's it's actually pretty fun to get them through the mail and take care of them. You'll get them, dip their dip their beaks in water the first day, and off they go. Um, and and it's interesting how hardy those birds are if they come in the right temperature. Because I've watched chicks dip their water, run around the pen, get a little bit of feed, and run over to the side and try to catch a fly off the side of the the side of the brooder so, that, so Hudson, it's, it's really fun Hudson if you if you pick up your chicks at a farm and ranch store or something along those lines uh, what do you want to look for uh, how, how do you make sure that that chick is going to be healthy when you get it home and and you can keep it going so I uh, it, I used to really kind of uh, be hard on some of the the farm stores because um, Sometimes they didn't do the best job taking care of their chickens. The farm stores that I've seen the last few years, the last four or five years, are doing an excellent job. You know, you'll be able to look at chicks um, and, and see if they're healthy. They're up. They're running around the pen. 
they're going underneath the heat and they're they're getting warm and then they're going out and they're getting water and they're getting uh, feed and then they'll kind of go back and go back into the light. Um, if you see chicks huddling or kind of off in the corner with their heads down, don't buy those. Um, you know, buy good, healthy chicks. And, and it doesn't really matter whether you get them through the mail or you get them through um, one of the farm stores, you're going to want to follow these six bullet points that I'm about to go through. So, Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, when we get the chicks, the, the first thing is, you know, they've been in the mail for two or three days or they've been in the farm store and they're a little bit stressed. We want to make sure that they, they get some water. Um, if you, they first come out of the box, if you just dip their beak in the water and then set them down in the brooder itself, and the brooder is really important. Um, you know, you got to have a brooder that works right for you. Those what do you chicks, mean by a brooder, Hudson? A is brood this a box? Is <clears throat> it a, a coop? What, what, what do you a, mean by brooder? A brooder, you can actually find them online and, and buy real brooders. Uh, people use little kids plastic swimming pools. I have a friend who gets a watermelon box every year just so they can have it as a brooder, just a cardboard box. Um, we have one built out of plywood. I mean, you can just have a brooder, but the brooder is going to provide these six things and I'll, and I'll visit with those. And so the brooder is where you put the birds until they really start feathering out. Um, you know, three weeks, they're, they're going to be in a brooder and we're going to provide them water feed, bedding, heat, light, and environment. And I'll just lightly touch on all six of these unless people have question. But the water is the most important the first day. These chicks can be a little bit dehydrated. When chicks hatch, they actually, the last day before they come out of the egg, they take the yolk and they actually put it right into there and they, they actually envelop um, their abdomen around the yolk. So they have a, a full yolk of egg to live on for you know several days and they can live for three or four days without any water or any feed but we want to get them on water as fast as possible um and so we'll get we'll dip that beak and then those chickens will drink immediately if they're healthy and they're warm they will they'll go back to the water as often as they need to feed i really like to use a chick starter when starting out um uh so the 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 chick starters changed a little bit but i i really with the meat birds i try to use a medicated chick starter there are non-medicated ones and with the with the layers it seems like you get along with the non non-medicated just fine um and what's the medicated for hudson what's it treat <clears throat> bird well those meat birds their metabolisms are so fast that if they just get it sick if they get a virus or bacteria those first several days so we usually try to have three days of medicated feed for the meat birds, um, just so they don't get a cold those first three days. Um, so the, the feed, um, ha, you know, have it in a low dish. We actually, that first day, we'll just make some piles right on, um, right on the floor. We won't even have it in a dish that first day to make sure that those chicks can just hit it and they just, they just eat it right up. So it's, it, it's not a big deal. Um, but I do like st having chick starter for the first two or three days at least. So. Sure. Just get them up strong and healthy. Right. The bedding, a lot of times people put too much bedding in the brooder itself. These are really small chicks, you know, out in the wild. Um, one of the, one of the reasons we hate cheat, cheat grass in Texas is because it, it grows up and the quail, the ch quail chicks can't actually walk through it it gets so close and they'll actually die because the quail chicks can't get through the, so um, just having them on cardboard with just a little bit of sawdust or is, is really enough, but, but we want it to be clean. We don't want a whole bunch of stuff for them to pick up. Um, you don't want something there that they can mistake for feed. And now heat, it's certainly, if it's not the most important, it's the second most important behind water. Okay. Um, Hold on, Hudson. Uh, it, so you're talking about particle size on that bedding, right? We want a bigger yes. particle so, size so it's not mistaken for food. Right. We want it to okay. be able to soak up some moisture and stuff, but we don't want them eating them. Okay. What do you mean by stuff, Hudson? <laughs> Isn't that scientific <laughs> enough for you, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> what did I say stuff about? <laughs> don't want them picking stuff up. Oh, no. yeah, we don't. We don't want them. We don't want them picking up anything that isn't actual feed. You know, the eighteen percent protein for those first few days. We 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 want to baby these chicks for a few days. So, 
the heat's really important. Um, you know, if you look online, um, they'll tell you one of the normal heat lamps will take care of 25 chicks. That really depends on where your brooder's at. Um, if you can limit a draft of air of any kind, um, and you know, if you've, if you've got them in 60 degrees, you don't need to have it as, but, but having that heat lamp there is really important. You're basically mimicking the ability that those chicks have to run underneath their mother and get warm and then run out from underneath their mother. And it's fun to watch, but the best way to know if your heat's right is to watch your chickens for a little while. They'll, they'll run underneath the heat lamp and they'll spread their wings out a little bit and they'll heat up. It's just, they're just like, ooh, that feels nice. And then they'll run back out. And so two things with the heat, you have to have that heat low enough that they can run underneath there and get warm, but you also need a place for them to get away from the heat. So, so, so you, need, you, you adjust the height of the lamp, right? right. That's yes, what, sir. Okay. Or but you or don't want it close enough that you start smoking feathers, right? Well, they won't stay there that long. Um, <laughs> But yes, you don't want smoking feathers. <laughs> that's, that's good advice. We'll call that Vardaman advice, not, uh, <laughs> not Hudson Hill advice. But um, the, the two ways to monitor that, Jeff, is, is really simple. If those chicks are underneath the lamp for a long time and they're all huddled underneath there, it's if there's a hot. draft or something, they're too cold. Okay. And then so on the, in the, on the reverse, if they're all out against the side of the brooder trying to stay away from the light, it's too hot. So yeah, you can raise the you can raise the lamp up and down. You can change the temperature, the ambient temperature in the trailer or the garage or the barn or wherever they have. Is, but, is uh, there is there a rule of thumb, Hudson, about distance yes. from them? Okay. Yes. Well, the day before we get chicks, we'll put the thermometer underneath the uh, underneath the heat lamp. Thank you for that question, by the way, because I would have forgot. But yeah, we actually put a thermometer right underneath the heat lamp. And right underneath the heat lamp, right where it's hitting the, the brooder floor, we want it to be 95 degrees. That's, you know, that's the temperature of their mother, and that's just what works for them. Okay. Perfect. Well, and I just wanted to throw out there, for anybody that you have questions, make sure to put those in the Q&A chat box for us, and we'll try and answer those as we go. If you're on Facebook Live, put it in the comments, and we'll, we're trying to track that best we can and, and bring those questions, too. So, great. What else, Hudson? So if we've, if we've got them a drink and we've got them fed and we have them warm enough, we are, you know, we're on the, we're on the road to being, to being where we want to be. The other two uh, things here, chickens love light. You know, the, the longer we can keep them in the light, the more light we have windows, you know, we, they, we tend to have a good spark in the dark, dark barn, but, but try to keep them light. And then the environment, I talked about not having a draft, but we, we don't want it to get too stuffy in there too. If, if we have it too tight and too extreme, the, you know, the chickens are um, going through a natural process of excrement and other things. We can get a high sulfur smell in there and some other things, but yeah, the, the environment can be great. Again, um, the best way to ruin a poultry project is to have a predator. Um, in, in your chickens at this stage, when we're talking about the chick stage, the predators that I've seen worst for dozens and dozens of people are their own house cat, right? Um, uh, I can tell story after story about going and, and people saying, I don't, I don't even know where the chickens are going. They're gone and I'll look <laughs> over and the cat's laying over in the side of so full that it can't move. <laughs> um, and I have, a, I have an idea where those chicks are. Going, right? uh, the neighbor's dog too. But at this point, at this point, these these chicks are really vulnerable. Chickens are always vulnerable, vulnerable to pre predators. But at this point, they're you know they're just a little tiny, really nice hors d'oeuvre for anything that. How about uh, so. coons and skunks? Is is this another <clears throat> predator for this? age group depending on where they're at um seen a lot of raccoons and skunks get into chickens usually when we get them out a little more out of the house out of the barn is is when we really have troubles with those predators and i'll talk about that for a minute but if if these if if skunks coons foxes anything have access to these birds um your your poultry project will be short-lived and grizzly bears uh Yes. Yeah. I'm I, at least not, for me, I've heard more of the adult birds, not the chicks, but 
you, if you want a grizzly bear attractant, you put out chi uh, chickens. It, it certainly could be true, but I have a, I have a cure for everything up to a grizzly bear <laughs> in just, in just a moment when we're talking about our, our predator stuff. So we have a couple of questions, Hudson. Fantastic. One of them has to do with the water. It's from Melissa. She says, do the chicks need vitamins in their water? Oh, good question. It is a really good question. Um, and, and one that I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to straddle the fence on a little. Who, who asked that question, Jenny? Melissa Sherman. Okay, Melissa. Um, generally, the answer is no. Um, there are there are several um, different mineral packs you can find online. Some of the some of the hatcheries actually sell a mineral pack. Um, I'll I'll tell you if you uh, if you run into a, a mineral a mineral problem with chicks at this age under a week age, the way you know is that the uh, they'll actually have their feces stick to their bum. Um, and it can be a problem because it can actually plug the cloaca. And if you do have that problem, and it, it's, it's, a, it's not rare, it's, you know, when, when we get several hundred chicks in, the kids will take a, a warm, wet paper towel and remove several little daubers off the back of chicks every year. Um, but if, if those chicks are dehydrated, if they're at that point, that's gonna be your sign um, there is a mineral pack. It certainly can't hurt, you know, and um, certainly could help your chickens. Uh, when we've had trouble with chicks coming in cold and really having a problem, we'll actually do, do uh, we'll actually do sugar water for the first day. Um, and that, that gets things going and it moves through. So um, most people are using a, a feed, a, a, a chick starter feed. And those, those chick starter feeds are a complete feed. So all the minerals, all the carbohydrates, all the proteins are in that feed. So if you do use a mineral pack, you only need it for the first couple of days. And in general, you won't need it at all. Great. We have another question. It's more about chicken behavior. So I don't know if you want it now for adult let's, chickens. Let, let's, let's do do it now. It's from Katie. She said, adult chickens, what techniques can be used to get existing chickens used to newcomers? Oh, so Katie's got a really hard question. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that, Katie, has to do with the type of chickens you, you started with. Um, but when we talk about, you know, middle school, you know, and the pecking order that gets established in middle school with our kids, that term pecking order comes from chickens. They, uh, and it doesn't matter how many chickens you have or where they're at, the chickens absolutely establish a pecking order. Um, so the, the, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things. Um, if you, if you, if you're really going to, um, introduce new chicks to an established herd, try to, at some point after the brooder, so at three or four weeks, try to keep those chickens right next to each other through a fence for a week or two. But space is the important thing. Um, um, and space, space for uh, sp space for the uh, the perch there where they go at night is really important. Um, eight to twelve inches per bird on the roost. If you if you end up having eight to twelve inches of roost space per bird, and those birds can get on and roost, and then they have enough room during the day that the lower pecking order birds can get away from the other birds. Um, and then, and <clears throat> I wish I knew Katie because I might be careful about what I say. I simply don't keep a rooster for more than a year. Um, I like the girls. I don't like the boys. Uh, you get a rooster over a year in age and he gets big. His, um, his feet, and he's a bully of the yard, right? He gets big. He gets, he gets his dew claws grow in and are sharp and heavy. Um, and then, as Jeff said, he has an attitude that I can't stand around my house. Um, you know, if you have little kids, the, the roosters set in the pecking order with them and usually wins. Um, and the chick, the kids are afraid to go in the backyard and some other things. So I just don't keep a rooster over a year. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that answered Katie's question. So. Great. So now we have our our chicks, maybe what we get past a week or two is, does anything change with that chick care? Uh, 
Um, so what are you guys seeing here? I'm you know, not sure what I've done. Screen. We're seeing your PowerPoint. I've had a report that maybe there's some lag and it's not actually showing up. So if you're switching back and forth between slides, give it a little bit to uh, show up. Okay. But we're seeing your slides. Now we're just seeing all of us. <laughs> you unshared. We that was nice. <gasps> we, Thanks, absolutely, we absolutely want to end that. So uh, on that note, while you're getting ready, I'd like to mention this structure behind me. This is a uh, mobile chicken coop. Uh, this is some of the programming that I did early on in um, uh, extension, uh, showing people how to build these things. Uh, this is a 12 bird coop. If anybody's interested in the plans, I can provide them to you. Uh, just get in touch with me and I can send them out your direction. Is that uh, something we can put up on the barnyards and backyards link if it's not there yet? Uh, yeah, probably. I can send that to Jenny and she can send it out as a link. You bet. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I do have a more extensive set of slides this morning than I was planning on, but um, the next thing I'm gonna to touch on really, really briefly is feed. Uh, most people feed a complete feed. They pick up a bag of feed at the, the, the feed store. And so uh, really quickly, you know, we need, we do need to provide these chickens with the proper nutrients. Um, you know, we can talk, we could go in really deep and talk about carbohydrates, proteins, fats, minerals, but I'm certainly not going to. Water's really important. And you can really monitor this. Um, and depending on how much those chickens are getting out and chasing bugs, um, insects are 32% protein, Jeff. You didn't, you didn't know that I knew something about insects. You didn't know, did you? You're, you're the man. <laughs> but, but insects are 32% protein. So, boy, you don't have to be getting very many insects to those chickens and then their nutritional needs come way down. And so this slide, hopefully everybody can see the slide here. When you're buying a complete feed, um, there's really five different types of, of feeds that we, that we get. The starter feed, it's for all classes of chickens. It's really just for while those birds are in the brooder. Um, it, it's formulated at the, the, um, the size and shape is really good for the small birds to use. What Grow, kind of age are you looking at for that then? You use the starter in, in the brooder for the first just couple of weeks of life, Jeremiah. Okay. Um, and then you go straight to a grower. A grower um, usually will have at least 18% protein. You can get it up to 24% protein if you know where to look. But 18% works for in, in pretty much every case. The grower is simply to get a, an extra amount of protein to those birds um, while, they are, while they are growing. Um, most birds are, are fully matured within 16 weeks. And so, you know, that grower, we, we'll, we'll end up using that grower for at least 12 weeks. So a developer is a lot like a, a, a grower. Um, it is specifically four layer pullets. And the only difference is the calcium in it. Um, and then there's a finisher. It's for meat chickens. It has extra energy in it. Um, the one thing I'll say after, after a, a layer hen gets to 16 weeks, there's layer mash. Um, the, the one mistake that I see people make with feed, um, and chickens is, is, around chickens who are gonna lay eggs and it's about the layer mash. Um, we really, when these chickens are gonna make eggs, we're really gonna push them hard productively. Um, a chicken in 18 months is gonna lay her body weight and a half twice just in eggshells. Eggshells are mostly calcium. So that chicken's ability to hmm. synthesize calcium and make a shell is really important. So before a chicken is laying an egg, we don't want calcium in their diet. So Katie asked earlier how you put chickens together. Well, before they're laying, we really don't want to add the younger chickens to the older pen if we're providing oyster shell or, or a calcium supplement. Um, layer mash will have a four, three to 4% calcium um, in it. And so we don't want to be feeding that layer mash until the pullets are actually um, laying eggs. And that's why there's a developer feed. It, the developer feed is the same feed just without calcium. And hopefully that made sense, fellas. Um, I think it did. Uh, okay. But at what what age or at what point does a chicken typically start laying eggs? 16 and when should, weeks. Okay, so then I should be incorporating them into the rest of the flock. 
Right. I'm, I'm, I think my next slide starts here and, and I'm going to talk about how to pick the breed that would work best for you. The real layer birds, the real birds that are um, the ones that Kim was talking about a few minutes ago, how to get the most eggs for feed. They'll be laying at 16 weeks. So your, you know, your, your leg horns, most of your sex think chickens uh, in that 16 week, if they're not laying eggs, we probably have made a mistake in the brooder or feeding them. Some of our multi-purpose birds will push out there to 20 weeks, but pretty much by week 21, if your birds aren't laying, you might not have gotten pullets. You might have gotten cockerels. So. Hudson, we have a question on feed from Melissa. Okay. She says, our feed store sent, sent home some small gravel slash grit to provide in a plate along with their feed. Mm -hmm. Is this necessary? It's called scratch. Um, necessary is an interesting word. So the scratch is usually a really cheap feed. Uh, and the best thing about it is we can, we can, we can put it out. Um, and actually now that I'm thinking, she, did you use the word grit, Jenny? Sorry, I was moving around. Um, yeah, I said, uh, she said okay. grit. So, I actually don't think it's, I actually don't think it's scratch. I think it's actual grit. So necessary. I can absolutely answer that question. It is not necessary if those, if those chickens have access to the outdoors, if they're, if they have access to dirt, the, the roadside, they're going to pick up their own grit. The grit is absolutely essential. Um, the bird actually uses the grit in their digestive process. The, the bird not getting too technical the birds have a crop that sits right here on their neck every morning they get up and they fill that crop up and all the rest of the day they're digesting that feed that they put in the crop the uh, we all know what a gizzard is um, it makes the best gravy right and so that gizzard is this huge muscle in, in, rel in relative to the chicken's body and it's this huge muscle that sets in there and grinds that feed just like a, a stone grinder um, and that 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 um, the grit. What's the organ called again? <laughs> the crop or the gizzard? The gizzard sits there with that huge muscle and it uses the grit inside. And if you've ever cleaned a, 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 a gizzard, you'll understand, but it just uses it inside that to digest the food. So um, grit is absolutely necessary. In very few cases, do you have to add the grit to the chicken's diet if they have any access to the outdoors? So. Hopefully That's a good that question. Answers. Hopefully yeah. that answers that, yeah. And there's kind of a little follow-up to your grit one. Um, they asked if the chicks and the brooder need the grit as well, correct? Whether it's from natural sources or bot. Can you hear me? Yep. It certainly wouldn't hurt to add a little grit. Um, they don't need it. They don't need it for the first couple of weeks as long as they're on the starter feed. Does anybody like raise crickets or grasshoppers in for the purpose of feeding chickens? Have Absolutely. you ever heard of that? Absolutely. Um, it's usually in the form of mealworms. Um, you, um, if you go to some of the, the more pet oriented chicken websites there, they all their all of those poultry owners buy mealworms, buy the bag, you know, buy the pound. And that's the treat that they give their, it's just like a dog treat for a chicken. It's just the treat. Um, they'll dump out, you know, a quarter pound of mealworms as a treat for their chickens. So, yes. So we had a question earlier about, about how, you know, what breed a chicken lays the most, um, the most eggs. Uh, you know, and I talked earlier about if you really want to be successful in agriculture, do something that you're going to enjoy, you're going to like. And so there's lots of different reasons to select laying hens. And we're talking specific laying hens here. We can talk meat birds in a minute. Um, I, when I go through this portion, I'm going to tongue-in-cheek give you my personal opinion several times, which means absolutely nothing for you. What I enjoy and what I want might not be what you want and those for those people who know me they'll pick the opposite thing just because they'll figure that'd be better see look at jeff shaking his head <laughs> so but these are the, the this criteria right here 
you know, depending on how much room you have, foraging ability might be really important. I talked about picking up those 32% protein earwigs. You know, you might want your hens going a quarter mile to, to chase some insects. Now with predators, you might not. And if you have neighbors close, you do not want your chickens in there. And so how far a chicken will range is really important. Um, the second thing is egg production. There are different birds that will lay more eggs than others, and it's more eggs per ounce of feed, right? And I'll tell you um, uh, where to start with that. Climate hardiness, it's funny, but um, those for those people who know chickens, they, they have chickens that are called feather-footed chickens, and you look at those birds and you're like, oh, those would be best for Wyoming because they have feathers on the feet, they'll stay warm. Those birds are the least climate hardy because they came from the south, right? The jungles, those are jungle fowl. Um, the, in, in essence, the chickens are fine here and they, and they do fine here. Um, uh, the, the bigger body, the bird tend to do a little better and lay a little better during, during our coldest parts of winter, you know, January and February. Multi-purpose is a, is a term that all the hatcheries will use and they use that term a multi-purpose bird simply means a bird that will lay eggs, but you can also use for meat. Um, I have a real personal opinion that if you're gonna do meat birds, if you're gonna spend the time to put them in your freezer, I buy a meat purpose bird. Um, behavior is so important to me. And they, I mentioned earlier, there are, there are chickens that absolutely will act as nice as a dog and a cat for, for and there are chickens who are just horrible to be around. They're, um, they're flighty, they're noisy. I mean, and so depending on how you want to keep them, now the flighty ones tend to not get eaten as often by the neighbor's dog, right? So that behavior is important. Egg shell, or mean, egg shell color means absolutely nothing to me, but people growing eggs in their backyard, who wants a white shell, right? And then some people even take it further. Um, there are chickens that'll lay a, a blue or a pink. And then cost and availability is important. Um, we see a lot of birds around because those are the ones that cost the least and they're the easiest to get out. Usually the bird that's gonna cost you the least to lay eggs is a, is a, is a sex-linked bird because at the, pul at, the, at the hatchery, you know, at the hatchery, the, the, the highest paid individual besides the owner is going to be the sexer. And what a sexer does is he's grabbing chickens all day long, he's turning them upside down and he's looking at their bottoms. Um, and so in order to get people to do that all day long, you have to pay them quite a little bit of money. Um, but it's, a, it's kind of a lost art and it's hard. It's, you know, it's something I can't do. Um, Hudson, that, can, you, can you clarify what sex link means? Yes, I'm about to. And okay. so, and so sex link birds, have a physical characteristic color or wings that they don't have to turn the chick upside down. Um, in my other presentation, I actually have a picture, but um, like with some birds, there'll be a spot right here on the male, but not on the female on top of their head. On others, you know, you'll see a, a brown wing and a, and a yellow wing. So, so those sex link birds are usually the cheapest. And since we've bred them and bred them and bred them, they lay really well too. So can you can you go back to that slide, Jenny? Of the, um, can you just take us through those slides now to the next slide, please? So this is Jeremiah's favorite chicken right here. <laughs> totally, um, and it, it dates us a little, I'm afraid. My kids don't know who this is. Um, My kids are still watching him right now. <laughs> uh, that dates you a little, I'm afraid. <laughs> this, is fog, this is foghorn leghorn, and everybody's heard of the leghorn chicken. Um, for, for that question that Kim asked earlier, uh, this is the chicken, not this chicken since he's a male, but um, leghorns will, will lay the most eggs uh, per ounce of feed, period. Um, they'll lay an egg almost every day. Um, and the leghorns, and that's what, that's why the leghorn is, is the, the chicken that's, you know, if you buy a, an egg in the grocery store, it probably came from a leghorn chicken. Um, and so when we go back to, don't move quite yet, Jenny, when we go back to, you know, go back one more slide, please, Jenny. When we go back to the criteria, so the egg production on that leghorn is going to be best. The, the, 
behavior on Leghorn is is the worst behavior that I could. I, I just can't stand. They're flighty. They're noisy. They don't like you around. Um, their eggshell color is going to be white. Uh, they're 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 really available. Um, and so, depending on what you're after, see, do you want a Leghorn or not? If you want brown eggshells, you don't want a Leghorn. And there are some other birds that will lay brown eggs. Um, almost, you know, within just a few ounces of feet of what a leghorn will do. So can you take the next? Hudson, is there a chart out there that uh, has the breeds and the characteristics and? There is. And okay. Uh, there is, and I have it in my other presentations. We don't have time to go through it today. Sure. Um, Maybe we could upload that with Jenny to the usually, and backyard. Jenny. I usually talk about about 20 different breeds of chicken in my presentation. Today I'm only going to talk about three. I just talked about the leghorn, which is a bird that I don't generally like, which really is in production 90%, right? I talked about um, people who want egg eggshell color and it being important. The Americunas and the Aracunas, they are called the Easter egg chicken. They will actually lay a, a, a blue egg and sometimes even a pink egg, and they're cool. The, the eggshell color is cool to look at. It's fun for the kids. Um, other than the leghorn, this is probably my least favorite chicken. And I, I have to argue this all the time with people because people love them. They're not generally nice birds to be around. Their behavior isn't great. They're not great um, about getting out there. And they, they're really low, low productivity. You're probably looking at four or five eggs a week out of, out of the aracunas. But they're blue, so they're cool, right? Um, and they're actually, the aracunas are getting better production than that now because they're breeding them that way. Um, but you know, it's just a trade off if you really want, um, and I don't care about eggshell color. So I've never owned a American or an Aracuna. So, uh, next slide, please, Jenny. Now I'll tell you about the best chicken there is out there. Right now. <clears throat> and I do this tongue in cheek for a reason because I love buff Orpingtons. They're a multi-purpose br breed. They work great in Wyoming. Um, you know, I like pretty horses. I like pretty dogs. I like things pretty. And the Buff Orpingtons are just a gorgeous chicken. Um, the kids can show them. They act just wonderful. They're like, they're just ladylike to be around, right? They just kind of walk around you. And, and if the kids mess with them a little bit, they can have them as pets. They just really make really nice birds. They're bigger. They're multi-purpose birds. They're bigger. So they're going to eat a little more feed. Um, they'll you know they'll lay um they'll lay five or six eggs a week um but they're just really pretty and that's why they're my favorite favorite bird the way they act and the way they look and so that kind of gives you the a really quick guideline hudson hills guidelines of of, of deciding which kind of bird you want right hold on hudson um, we got a question okay. um and i believe it was on the leghorn and it said, okay, are they nice pets too? This one comes from Kim. Uh, no, I thought I, I thought I touched on their behavior. They don't act well. They're really flighty. They're really noisy. Um, and they don't really enjoy people being around. They, they're really about production. Um, I, if I, if I was looking for a bird to have as a docile animal around to be pet like or have the kids messing with it would not be uh, a leghorn. Okay. It would, it would be the buff Orpington right here. Right. Right. Thanks for clarifying that. You the bet. The Hudson Hill selection. <laughs> yeah, right. And I went really quick and I only talked yep. about three breeds, but those three breeds hopefully showed you <clears throat> the different kinds of reasons you would be um, selecting yeah, birds. If you want so, birds, I'll oh, go ahead, Jeff. So are they all tasty? So the, their eggs we we're only talking about layers at this point okay all right, right. okay <laughs> their eggs are all going to taste the same depending on feed right okay um but there are there are chickens that'll range a lot further than other chickens there are chickens that will make a lot more noise than other chickens there's chickens that so so kind of doing a little research into that um might add some enjoyment to your your poultry projects so just to let you know hudson we got about six more minutes to wrap up so okay. are there any breeds that you want to throw out there for the meat birds and then did you want to save some time for 
a brief discussion about predators, or maybe we've covered that enough. Okay, if 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 Jenny could just keep going on the slides, and we don't have questions, we'll just keep going and get done then. So, um, but now now's a great time. A bit, it'll be okay. Now's a great time for questions if anybody has any. Jenny, if Jenny could move us along on the slides. <laughs> You're asking Jenny to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, too far. You've moved us along too far. Okay, one more. One more. <laughs> one more. Going right. the other direction, right? No, just going down. Mm. Oh, I need Where do you want to be? Which side? Um, just keep going, please, Jenny. Forward. Yeah. Okay. So predators? stop right there. So predators, I, I've mentioned this several times. Um, and the reason I have is because I've seen just uh, bad, a, a bad project after bad project with predators. And I've seen, um, I've seen everything from the, from the house cat to the neighbor's dog to their own dog, raccoons, skunks, foxes, coyotes. I have not seen a bear in the chickens, uh, Jeremiah, but um, this is a picture of my backyard. Um, those, those chickens right there um, <clears throat> are, are about six weeks old um, and they are protected from every four-footed predator. Um, that's an electric fence. It will stop a grizzly bear. Um, it'll stop a uh, um, the neighbor's dog. And I have lots of anecdotal research on the neighbor's dog thing. Um, and it'll absolutely stop skunks. So as long as that fence, as long as our, our charger's on, um, that fence will keep the predators out. Uh, I have seen a case or two where we've had some... Uh, avian species pick up a chicken or two, but it's pretty rare. Um, and this will not stop two-footed predators. So if, <laughs> if your neighbor wants to steal some, they can. But, but um, there's some other ways, especially with layers. Uh, years ago, Backyards and Barnyards ran a really good article, and, and you can still find it, um, about building an automatic door for your chicken coop. Um, but but taking care of predators is absolutely essential. And I'm, I'm assuming I'm talking to a, a mostly Wyoming um, audience here. I've seen examples in our biggest cities, Casper and Cheyenne, right downtown, where you're having these serious predators in with the chickens. You know, there's raccoons and skunks and foxes and cows right downtown in Casper and Cheyenne um, and every other town in, in Wyoming. So. Don't assume because you got through a year without predators that you won't have them in another year. Um, I've had neighbors who have gone for two or three years and then lost their whole whole poultry project. So um, I was I was really expecting some questions about predators, but if we don't have any, um, I'll talk about meat birds really quick. Yeah, that's in the the where I've heard about that is from the large carnivore biologist with game and fish here out of Cody. And he says some of the biggest calls he has is up the North Fork and South Fork where people put chickens in and those grizzly bears get in the middle of them. There was an individual that put their, they used the old homestead uh, cabin as the chicken coop and the grizzly bear dug through the sod roof to get to those chickens. So yeah. There's some really, there's some really good research with the bears and electric fence and it flat out works. Um, there, you know, there's, there's the grizzly bear world right here across the, across the border into Idaho and they've done a lot of work with electric fence and the electric fence will keep them out of Snickers bars. So <laughs> if it'll keep them out of Snickers bars, it'll <laughs> absolutely keep them out of chickens. So, um, so yeah. Yeah, let's go into meat bird uh, breeds. Was there a couple of slides there on, on meat birds at the very end, Jenny? So, so there is a question here first um, uh, from Jessica. Is it necessary to have a roof on the chicken run? Hi, Jessica. Necessary, again, is an interesting term. Um, the, the chicken run absolutely doesn't need a roof, and I would actually suggest not having a roof on the chicken run. Uh, uh, all avian species do well to get sun and and a little rain on them. 
However, you will need a covered place for those chickens to get in and roost under um, and keep, especially during winter, we need to keep them dry and out of the wind. But the chicken run where they're getting out and getting exercise, picking up some scratch and some other stuff, I would suggest it's better to not have covered. Hopefully that answers the question. So do you, yeah, need, it, so. Do you need it covered with fencing if you have avian predators? Oh, if that's an avian predator question, I will, I will qualify that with, um, it's, it's pretty rare, at least in Wyoming, to have our, our hawks and eagles start picking up chickens. Um, it happens occasionally. And when you have one, especially if she's nesting, she may pick one up every day for a while. But most of the places in Wyoming, there's plenty of natural um, uh, food food for our hawks. There's plenty of small, small rodents and other stuff. We have a nesting set of... Uh, uh, peregrine falcons in our yard almost every every year and they fly right over our chickens every day and they just we've never had a problem that being said if you start having a problem um, covering it covering it would work there's also some some research into just adding structure so it wouldn't have to be covered with like something that the birds actually couldn't go through just something that's 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 not allowing them to to take their natural dive um, and the chick and so the chickens can kind of be under should be enough to deter um, the uh, the hawks and eagles if they start having a problem covering it for a while it will just have to you'll just have to protect the chickens for a while until the 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 hawks stop using them but it's it's pretty rare Jenny so you yeah. wouldn't have to get into like like bird netting like they use on those game farms where they completely enclose with a net. You might have, if you've got a nesting, and so the ones I've seen are red tail hawks. If you have a nesting red tail hawk and she starts using the birds, she might pick up a bird every day. So covering it with that netting might might work, and, but it wouldn't have to be a permanent thing. It could be a temporary thing. Yeah, Jessica says they have eagles. Have they ever had eagles get their chickens though? Um, we, we have bald eagles in our, in our back trees all the time um, for months at a time, every day. And we have never lost a bird that I know of to a hawk or an eagle. It's just not their natural, it's just not their natural instinct to pick up those. And we usually have white, white birds, but, um, but if they start, if they start picking them up, they're going to pick them up a lot. So. So Kim says, if there isn't a roof on the chicken run, how do you keep the neighbor's cat out? And then she had another comment that maybe netting is the answer for the cats as well. Right. So. I, I've left it a little open on the thing I've, I've stressed keeping the predators out. Um, I showed you that picture of my birds. There wasn't a roof over them, but that's because of the electric fence. Um, that fence is electrified and it'll keep everything out. Um, cats usually won't be too hard on adult birds. And so if you're, if you like the, the article on closing the chicken coop door, um, if you can get the chickens inside at night and that door will close on them, um, you'll usually protect them from the cats and the dogs. Um, but, but yeah, you have to have a plan for whatever's bothering you at the time. The reason I like the electricity is because it works for everything. Um, um, every four footed predator while, while the electricity's on. So, we have another critter questions, but it's not to do with predators. It's from JC. Any suggestions to keep rodents out of the feeder? There are chickens that'll eat rodents. If they could get a few morons. <laughs> um, no, I don't have any great tips for, for rodents other than, you know, how we'd control rodents in every other situation. The rodents are getting in um, because they're, they're eating, right? Um, when we talk about controlling rodents or other pests in our lives, the first thing we try to do is take away the food source. The second thing we try to do is take away where they're living. So if they know where the rodents are coming from, the third thing we do is we, we terminate the, the pest problem, right? So traps and poisons and other things like that. Thank you.
Oh, thank you, Jenny. So, so I looked on the slides. I didn't see any, particularly on meat birds, but there was some on harvesting. How long is your video, Hudson? It's only a couple minutes. Um, so am I sharing my screen? Yep. Yes. Yep. So these are some meat birds that are getting pretty close to ready to go here. Um, a couple things about couple things about meat birds that I want to say. If you want to take birds and put them in your own freezer, I really encourage you to do meat birds. And, and the reason I say that is because you're going to have a lot of time and effort and finances in, into these birds. Um, and it, it's really quite a bit of effort. Um, it's worth, the effort's worth it. But, uh, you know, when you take a, a multi-purpose bird that you're, you will also lay hens, you don't just, you just don't come out with Sunday dinner, right? You come out, you come out with chicken soup and it, and it really is a difference. So if we're going to buy birds and feed birds to be meat birds, I really encourage meat birds. Now that being said, the bird here on the screen is called a Cornish cross. Um, they are the fastest growing, um, most productive bird. These birds, if you buy, if you eat chicken at, at, a, at a fast food restaurant, you're eating a chicken that's six or seven weeks old. Um, and these birds grow that fast. Because they grow so fast, inherently they're a little harder to raise. There's also a couple of other breeds that work better if you're gonna want them out eating grass. Um, the, there's some red rangers. Uh, there's a couple of, of multicolored birds that do a really nice job. Those birds will take you up to 12 weeks to get to where you finish. Um, my my, I just want to I just want to stress that if if you want meat birds and you use a meat bird breed, you'll come up with a different product. Um, after that, being able to process the birds and um, and, and put the birds in the freezer the right way is just really important. Uh, I've had the, the wonderful opportunity to teach people in almost every county in Wyoming how to take birds and put them in their own freezer. Um, but it's really important that you do it right for food quality. Again, if we're gonna spend all the time and effort to get these birds raised, um, there's no reason we shouldn't raise them to be really nice Sunday dinner type of stuff. This is again, my backyard. This is the automatic plucker that we built. Um, and, and, and we can watch the video here in a minute if we want. So, um, there, I have a little bulletin that I can send out with people that have a list of kind of equipment to use just backyard equipment and, um, six steps to take to, to put the free, the birds in the freezer the right way. The first step in my, my bird processing, um, seems, seems silly almost, right? We want to catch the birds. That's step number one, Jeremiah. So, one the of the hardest. Time, the way, next time I'm up in Powell uh, and do chickens, I want Jeremiah there because I'm going to let him do step one, catch the bird. Um, but it's important, you know, we're talking about food quality. We want to catch the birds in a small space. We want to handle them really soft. We want to be, be gentle. We don't want any extra stress on these animals. And so we just go through the six steps. The last step is, is putting them in bags and putting them in the freezer. So, um, Here's, you know, here's the second step here. Um, put chickens in the cones and, uh, and um, actually slaughter them. So uh, any, any questions? And we can try to see if I could get that one video up if we wanted of the plucker working, but um, it's up to you guys. So I think if we have time, you should play it uh, just because it is uh, pretty amazing how quickly it works. I think the amazing part can all be credited to Hudson Hill on that deal, right? Because yes, you are truly amazing. How's that? <laughs> that? That was good. Can I get that in? Can I get that in writing? This one's recorded. Oh, I think even it's better. recorded forever now, so you know. All right. Let me see. With those meat birds, did you have a favorite breed that you like for the meat? Um, I've done all three uh, for time. 
for time wise, the Cornish cross just work really well for us because we've got a system that works. Um, the Red Rangers, if you're going to have them out and uh, um, Sorry, Jenny. Your video. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I was I was doing something else. Um, the Red Rangers work really well, and then the, they've got that new Bountiful bird that gets really big, um, and I I like that bird also. So I don't necessarily have a favorite other than what I'm trying to get accomplished that year, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. So the video is only a couple of minutes long getting to the video. However. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can see can it. Can you hear it? We can see it. Can't no, you're going to, you're going to have to narrate, can narrate it. As you go. <laughs> All right. We're just counting 10 seconds here in the hot water. Um, as you, uh, as you count to 10, you monitor the birds. If you can pick the bird up with the wings feather, see how those feathers came out easy. It's close. I'm going to give it three more seconds. So how hot's that water? Boiling, I'm speculating? No, it's not boiling. So now I'm gonna put that bird in the plucker and I'm gonna to count to 10. If your water's right, in 10 seconds that chicken will be plucked. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. We had a... That's amazing. That's what everybody says. <laughs> I remember plucking chickens with my grandparents, and it took a long time. This day, it worked out just perfect. My water was right. Fine. Jeremiah, I start the water at 165 degrees, okay. and then I monitor up and down from that. On a hot day, you might actually go down a little. And your water, you can change how long the chickens are in the water um, and, and do it. Sometimes my kids want to do it at night. Sometimes I want to do it in the morning, and the water will change a little bit. But in, in this instant, on this video, I had the chicken in the water for a count of 12 or 13. And then we had the, the chicken in the plucker for the count of about 10. And, you know, I'll turn the video back on, but the, the chicken was completely plucked. So, so Kim asks, isn't it battered when it came out? And at first I was thinking <laughs> she meant like battered in dough, but I think she means beat up. So. Beaten up, bruised. <laughs> yes, I got it finally. <laughs> if well, it could so. do both would be good, right? If it could be battered, <laughs> I, ready I to re dip in. <laughs> I, really wished, I really wished the sound was on at this point because I'm explaining to the class that this video is from a class that we taught. I'm explaining to the class how perfect this chicken looks. Um, when I, when I do that class, Jenny, I actually put my hand in and, and, and let the students watch my hand run on top of those plucking fingers. Those plucking fingers are soft. Um, if your temp water temperature is right, you don't break the skin. You don't bruise anything. Um, I mean, that bird that's in my hands right there is absolutely perfect. So, um, the fingers, the fingers are expensive and they're expensive for a reason. They do exactly what they're supposed to do. I wouldn't say that the fingers are soft; they're rubber. So they right? handle the bird. They handle the bird in a way that it doesn't. Yeah, they're not necessarily soft, but you can put your hand in there and let your hand run over it. Right? Yeah. Um, it handles the bird in in the correct manner. If you have the bird in the water too long or the water's too hot, the fingers will absolutely start tearing some skin, and they can actually. If, the, if you get it way too hot, it, they'll actually pull some meat off. But, but no, you're not damaging the meat in, in any way if your water temperature is right. And Jeff was there that day we made this video. Um, I was. That, that was his wife in the background there. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, the plucker does it. And it, if, you, um, if you want a really great experience, you don't use the automatic plucker. You just hang that chicken up by a hind foot and pluck it by hand, and then you'll really appreciate um, the automatic plucker. <laughs> well, you'll you'll appreciate the automatic plucker. Um, my my boy one day shut down for three birds. I said, "We'll just pluck these three birds by hand," and he wouldn't. He wouldn't do them by hand. He was, "I'll, I'll do it another day, Dad." For that, <laughs> but um, but no, if you pluck them by hand, you'll really you'll really appreciate um, eating chicken after that. So, the the automatic plucker does make it quite nice. So. Um, but it's the reason I showed that video 
if you do it right, you've got a great product that goes in the freezer, but if you're not going to do it right, if you're not going to go to the, um, the, the, if you're not going to go to the, st the stress of, of getting that bird done the correct way, um, don't raise meat birds, right? Uh, raise layers, do something else, um, buy your, buy your chicken out of the store. So, because that process, that process of putting the birds in the freezer is pretty important. It's simple. It's not rocket science. There's six easy steps. Um, when my boy was nine years old, we left him with a set of people one day and I said, I'll be right back. And I came back and he was teaching the whole class. He was, he had the, the entire neighbor, all the neighborhood kids lined out and there was barely enough birds left for me to teach the adults when we got back. So at nine years old, I mean, I had taught my boy to be able to do it. Um, um, but doing it correctly is important. So I'm going to jump off my soapbox now, Jeremiah. So. I appreciate it. Are any other questions or have we not, is there something that we've missed in topics? I think we covered most of the ones that we had on the meat and birds. Okay. Any other general questions, Jenny? Uh, we, the presentation today was pretty simple, just kind of how to get started and how to how to be successful in your in your first project. A lot of it you learn along the way, right? And again, these birds are pretty hardy. They take care of themselves for the most part. So well, great. Doesn't sound like there's any more questions. So Hudson, thank you very much for taking the time to join us on this. It was very informative. I think it's fantastic. And for all you out there, please, please reach out to us. And if you got specific questions on your poultries or looking at getting into it, let reach out to Hudson or your local extension office. So uh, as always, you know, we have more of these uh, Zoom meetings coming up. We're doing them Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. And if you want to see a list of that, you can go on to the the URL here on the left hand side of the page, uh, Barnyards and Backyards website, and you can see a list of other meetings coming up. You can also go back and review and watch the videos of these, the, the ones that we did get recorded. Um, so we really appreciate you joining us as well as we talked about uh, connecting with your local extension office is a great resource and so reach out to those how you can get in touch with your county office if you're not aware of them is the url code on the right hand side of the screen and all of our offices are still open even under the circumstances right now some people might be working from home but they're still answering phone calls and emails so get in touch with us but with that we're going to close out thank you very much we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks, Hudson. Thanks, have Hudson. Good, have a good